In this video, I want to talk about competitive inhibitors and non-competitive inhibitors of enzymes and how they affect the line weaver Burke plot. So let's begin by talking about a de about de the definitions of both competitive and non-competitive inhibitors um, individually and sort of what they do. So inhibitors, obviously, they're going, going to inhibit the function of the enzyme. How? So if you think about competitive inhibitors, you think of the word compete, right? So competitive inhibitors, they compete with the substrate for binding at the active site, okay? So competitive inhibitors, they bind at the active site of an enzyme, okay? So in that sense, they're sort of um, competing, right, with the substrate, right? And I'm going to abbreviate um, substrate as S, and I'm going to in abbreviate inhibitors as I. So they're competing for the substrate. So um, they're both trying to bind at the active site, um, competitive inhibitors and the substrate. So whereas non-competitive inhibitors are a little bit different. They bind at a site other than the active site. Okay. <laughs> okay. So with competitive inhibitors, if the substrate binds at the active site, then the inhibitor can't. But if the inhibitor binds at the active site, then the substrate can't. So essentially, what's going on here is that you can't have... Um, essentially, actually, let me write this down. So I, the inhibitor, blocks the substrate S from binding. Okay? So if the substrate can't bind, the enzyme is inhibited from doing its function, which is to turn that substrate into a product. Okay, so now the I blocks the S from, from binding. So this means then that that you can't have have the substrate and the inhibitor bind at the same time. Okay. So if this is the case, if I is blocking the substrate from binding and you can't have the substrate and the inhibitor bind at the same time because they both bind the same site, essentially what you have is you have um, you have reduced this, these competitive inhibitors reduce the enzyme's affinity for their substrate. Right, because you can't have the substrate and the inhibitor bind at the same time. So once the in, the enzyme binds an inhibitor, it can't bind the substrate. So it has once it binds the inhibitor, it has a reduced affinity for its substrate. Now, we've talked about a particular measure of affinity earlier, and that was Km. So if we have reduced the enzyme's affinity for the substrate, what did we do to the Km? If you recall, we've increased the Km. This means that the Km increases because a high Km means a low affinity and a low Km means a high affinity. So if here we reduce the enzyme's affinity for the substrate, then the Km must have increased. Okay, so that means when we plot the line weaver Burke plot, which intercept should we expect to, to change? Well, the x intercept. The x intercept will change. Okay, so I'm going to note that here. Okay, so if the Km increases, that means the x intercept should change. Okay, the x intercept changed. What about Vmax? What happens to Vmax? In the case of a, a competitive inhibitor, um, the Vmax does not change. And the reason why is quite simply because you can still basically since since it's basically a war of numbers, and what I mean by that is that the substrate and the inhibitor are both trying to get to that active site. Whichever one there's more of is probably going to be the thing that's likely to bind the enzyme. So if you add the inhibitor and you I mean you're going to reduce the Vmax to a certain extent, but you can overcome that by adding by adding substrate, right? And eventually if you add a, a high enough substrate concentration, you can still reach that Vmax because then then it's basically a war of numbers. If there's let's say um 10 enzymes and you add 10 inhibitors and you only have 5 substrates. Well, the inhibitors are going to sort of take over. But if you add a thousand or a million substrates, then they're going to overpower the effect of the inhibitor. 
So the Vmax will not change because because um, you can add because adding substrate or adding more substrate can overcome the effect. of the competitive inhibitor. I'm going to abbreviate competitive inhibitor just like this. Com comp inhib. Okay, so the Vmax does not change, which means that the y-intercept stays the same. Okay, so that's what we should expect for competitive inhibitors. And just to give you a quick little visual, I suppose, if you imagine a uh, an enzyme looking like this, right, um, and it has a substrate that's circular, and you you have an inhibitor that is also around the same size or at least circular they can both fit in this active site right so whichever one binds is going to stop the other one from binding okay for non-competitive inhibitors we've just noted here that that um, earlier that they're a little bit different they bind at a site other than the active site okay so um, the way they inhibit um, enzymes is they inhibit um, the enzyme by changing its conformation. Uh, conformation, which is sort of just like the overall structure, right? We talked earlier about hemoglobin and myoglobin and how they have, or excuse me, hemoglobin in particular, actually. We talked about how it has an R state and a T state. Those are two different conformations. When you change the conformation of a particular protein, you can alter its function. So, um, what what happens with com non competitive inhibitors is they're a little bit different. So what happens is that when um with the inhibitor binds at a site other than the active site. So essentially what's can happen is that you can have the enzyme bound to the substrate and to the inhibitor. Okay? So uh, so um enzyme can have both the substrate and the inhibitor bound at the same time. Why is that? Well, because they're binding at different sites, right? So if the active site is taken up by the by the substrate, then the, a site somewhere else is where the inhibitor is going to bind. So what ends what what they sort of um, represent that by? They kind of mention that as um, uh, the ESI. Right, the enzyme substrate inhibitor complex can form. Right, that this cannot the ESI complex cannot form with competitive inhibitors, but with non-competitive inhibitors it can. Okay, so what happens here? This enzyme substrate inhibitor complex, once it's formed, it is it you know it makes the enzyme less effective. How does it actually do that? Um, actually, before I mention that. Uh, before I go into that particular detail, if the enzyme substrate and inhibitor can all bind at the same time, then there's no reduced affinity, right? There's no reduced affinity for for the substrate. Okay, so there's no reduced affinity for the substrate, right? Which means what happened to the KM? It should have stayed the same. Right, right which means uh, that we shouldn't see a difference in our x-intercept, right? The x-intercept should be the same. But now, this enzyme substrate inhibitor complex, right, is not effective, okay? Um, complex, that complex cannot um, make product. So what ends up happening is this this enzyme is reduced in its effectiveness specifically its vmax is lowered okay so the vmax decreases okay which means that we should expect to see a um a difference in our y intercept the y intercept changed Okay, so um, note here though that there you cannot cannot overcome the effect.
of a non-competitive inhibitor um, by adding more substrate. And the reason why is because the enzyme substrate complex, the enzyme substrate inhibitor complex can still form. Okay. So let's kind of see how this all plays into the line we were work plot. Actually, in just a moment. Um, here, if we have a non-competitive inhibitor and we have an enzyme that looks like this, um, for instance, okay, let's say this is the active site here, okay, and this is another site, okay. So we can imagine the substrate, the substrate being, you know, circular and able to fit here, right? And then we can imagine the inhibitor, the inhibitor being, um, you know, something that could fit there. So if we, if this all happens to, 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 you know, form, we can get this sort of, um, this sort of confirmation here in which we have the inhibitor bound, right? And the substrate bound, right? And this here now is the, um, the enzyme substrate inhibitor complex, right? Which is rendered pretty much useless. Okay, so how do these affect the Langweaver work plot? Okay, so if we have a Langweaver work plot with no inhibitor, this is what we got here. Okay, we have a particular y intercept, a particular x intercept, right? So in the case of a competitive inhibitor, as we just mentioned just a moment ago, right, we have a change in Km, so as the Km increases, so the x intercept changed, right? But but the Vmax did not, so we'll still have the same y intercept. So with a competitive inhibitor, with a competitive inhibitor, the Km increased. Okay? So the x intercept changed. Now, where did the x intercept move? Did it move to the left or to the right? Well, let's think about this. If the Km increased, right, what does that mean? That means the x intercept, right, is equal to since it's equal to negative one over the Km, the Km is now a bigger number then 1 divided by a bigger number is going to yield a smaller x-intercept, right? So for a competitive inhibitor, let's do this in green. So for a competitive inhibitor, right, we should expect, since the Km is bigger, the x-intercept will be smaller, right, in magnitude. Right? So what's smaller in magnitude, a shift to the left or a shift to the right? Well, if this here, this number is zero, right, um, as you move away from zero, you're increasing in magnitude. So if the x-intercept is now smaller in magnitude, we would expect the shift to the right, okay? So the x-intercept shifts to the right. So for a competitive inhibitor, you would still expect it to intersect at the y-intercept here, right? The same y-intercept, but now, since it's Km changed, we have a new x-intercept. So this is how it would, the graph would look with a competitive inhibitor right the x-intercept shifts to the right because a larger km makes a smaller x-intercept okay so then how would that that uh, how would a non-competitive inhibitor uh, how would its graph change well it would have the same x-intercept right as we mentioned earlier have the same x-intercept because the km stays the same but the vmax decreased so the so the y-intercept changed Okay, so let's do this in purple. So for for a non-competitive inhibitor, for a non-competitive inhibitor, what should happen? Well, Vmax decreased, right? So Vmax involves the y-intercept. So if we have the Vmax, right, the Vmax was smaller. So 1 divided by a smaller Vmax will yield a larger y-intercept. So the y-intercept will be larger in magnitude, right? So here, if we're dividing by a smaller Vmax, then the y-intercept will be a bigger number. Well, what's bigger, a shift up or down? Well, the bigger numbers are, are upwards, right? So the, for a, a, a non-competitive inhibitor, we'd still have that same, that same x value, but we'd have a larger y-intercept. So it looks something like this, okay? So this purple graph is with a non-competitive inhibitor, okay? 
So a, a non-competitive inhibitor would shift the y-intercept upwards. Okay, so this is a new y-intercept, right? And then the same x-intercept. And then for for the competitive inhibitor, we have a new x-intercept. Okay, so I hope that all makes sense, and I hope that was very helpful. Um, I'll now provide you in the next video. I'll provide you with an example of the language report plot, and I hope that'll be helpful as well. See you next time.